Our guest today is the former majorette of the Rita Etz and St. Rita High School with the marching band. Our guest today can still twirl her baton with great precision, and she can still fit easily into her high school marching uniform. <laughs> Our guest today's devotion to children comes out of her family life. She has always been a leading advocate for our community's most vulnerable citizens. At the Chicago Park District, where she taught physical education to the mentally retarded children. In her private practice for Governor Edgar as special counsel for child welfare services, and now on the appellate court. Her role in the Special Olympics is legendary. That contribution alone should assure her of front row in heaven. The bishops did not have to look very far to find the perfect person for this challenging job. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, Appellate Court Justice Ann Burke. Justice. Thank you. If I were in court, I could press that button and you could all sit down immediately. <laughs> but good afternoon. Thank you, Jay, for that kind introduction. And I probably really should have brought my baton, or at least an umbrella, which I, I do um, twirl on occasion after 11 o'clock p.m. <laughs> I am delighted to have this opportunity of addressing the City Club, an organization that boldly bubbles with real spirit of Chicago, thanks to the leadership of that well-honed instincts of Jay Doherty. I have to admit that when Jay first asked me to speak, I could not have known how tired I would be after this past week. I don't think I have ever spoken so much. Just ask Ed, and that's why he left, I think. <laughs> so this afternoon, I come to the City Club after the adrenaline pushed and energized events that began last Wednesday for me in Washington. I thought that the best indicator of how hassled I was getting was when I left my hotel room on Thursday evening for dinner and noticed just before I got in the elevator with Leon Panetta that I was wearing one brown shoe and one black shoe. <laughs> but they did match. <laughs> As with most great endeavors, however, the events of the past 20 months have been grueling. At this point, truthfully, I am not sure what I expected when I was first asked by Bishop Wilton Gregory to be a member of the core group of the National Review Board of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I am no stranger to hardworking boards, but in all honesty, this one took the cake for energy expended, unprecedented stress, sleepless nights, and air miles. By now, at least if you watch the news shows this weekend, I am sure that many of you have a larger picture of the inner workings of the Roman Catholic Church in America than you ever have had before. If not, I hope you will today. Let me begin by saying three things. First, you may have already heard that in the reports about which I speak, 11,000 victims we know about of abuse have been identified across the nation. What that number cannot tell you is the sea of pain those victims have endured through the years or the unreported pain of those frightened still to speak up. All first words must be of them with our pledge that there be no more victims. 
Secondly, no discussion of the horrifying failings of the Roman Catholic leadership in this country in relation to the issue of sexual abuse of minors by members of the clergy should be undertaken without speaking some words of, su of the support for the more than 10,000 faithful, hardworking priests in the United States. These men have endured heartache and even personal disparagement because of the actions of a small percentage of Catholic clergy. These men deserve our highest support. They have earned it by their countless expressions of holiness, compassion, generosity that they have given, often at great sacrifice. I hope that each of you will be sensitive to how this crisis has victimized them as well. Be understanding of them and kind to them. They can really use a word of encouragement. Thirdly, I would say a word about the Catholic Church itself. Whatever your personal experience may be, I have to say that as a lifelong Catholic, and truthfully, as a person who loves the Church, this has been an experience of tough love. As a rational thinking person and a legal professional, I have had to recognize the difference between the church and the hierarchy. I hope we all do. While some of our leaders may have failed us, others among them have sought to seek the right thing. I believe they have begun to accomplish this in convening an unprecedented lay board on which I have been serving. It is a deep expression of their willingness to respond to this abuse crisis in the most effective way and systemic way possible. I have my suspicions. Some of the bishops may not have envisioned the full scope or the impact of what they set in motion or what we have accomplished, but they have not fled from the challenge of the issue. Some of them may have preferred it if our board was less aggressive less intrusive, more controllable, or just more easygoing. It just never happened. Some of them might not have wanted an engaging female Southside Irish Illinois appellate court justice <laughs> who finds taking no for an answer simply unacceptable. But last Friday, in the release of the two reports on the sexual abuse of minors, one, the first statistical analysis ever, and the other, our board's findings on some of the causes and context of the crisis. The bishops of the United States took a brave but necessary step. I saw a few smiling faces in Washington last week. There was little to smile about. On the other hand, and maybe this is just my Irish compulsion for always trying to find something to cheer about, but I believe there was good news to celebrate. The issue, of course, is horrific. The longer I spent studying it and talking to others about it, the worse I felt. But at the same time, I have been really encouraged by the fact that something concrete was underway that has the authority and the opportunity to ensure that such abuse cannot happen again, and that cases of abuse that do arise in the future will be dealt with in an appropriate manner everywhere, no matter who is in charge. The Catholic bishops of the United States did set in motion a process to help achieve this, in many ways, at great cost to themselves. Let me give you a quick <laughs> overview how this came about. After the disastrous reports of the sexual abuse of minors in the Boston Archdiocese were underway just about two years ago, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops made a decision to address the issue of abuse at their summer meeting in Dallas. At that meeting, they proposed a unified code of response to the issue that was approved by a majority of vote of the entire conference. This document is called the Charter for the Protection of Children and Youth. Contained within this document is a section called for the establishment of a board mandated to investigate the issue of clerical abuse and to establish an office at the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the conference. 
that would oversee the protection of children and youth, I was asked to serve on this board. The board was filled with strong contingent of type A personalities. You probably know some of them. In addition to Leon, who was President Clinton's self or chief of staff and longtime congressman, the hard-nosed Washington attorney Bob Bennett, Clinton's lawyer, and Bill Burley, CEO of Scripps, formed an important leadership core of the board. In addition, we have Dean Nick Cafardi, a canon and civil lawyer, Dean of Duquesne Law School, Dr. Alice Burke Hayes, no relation, a Chicagoan and former president of the University of San Diego and an eminent researcher. Chief Justice Petra Jimenez Meyers of the New Mexico Supreme Court, Chicago psychologist Dr. Michael Bland, an abuse victim himself and a former priest. John Hopkins University Behavioral Psychiatric Chair, Dr. Paul McHugh, former Kentucky Conference President Jane <coughs> Childs, well-known criminal defense attorney Pam Hayes, and the de dearest of all, Ray Siegfried, whom every Notre Dame alumni will know from his extraordinary financial support of the university. Ray came to all of our meetings practically on life support suffering from the final stages of Lou Gehrig's disease. Our work will be his greatest legacy to the church. For the first year, former Governor Keating of Oklahoma chaired the group. After his very public departure, I was chosen as interim chair. I'm looking for a more discreet exit. <laughs> <laughs> After what appears, in hindsight, pure genius, we began work structuring our subcommittees. Bob Bennett, Chair of the Causes and Context, Bill Burley, Chair of Communications Committee. Our first goal was the establishment of the Office of Child and Youth Protection and the search for the director of this office. After an extensive national search process, Dr. Kathleen McChesney, the number three in command in the FBI, was chosen. Those of you who have had any dealings with the F FBI in Chicago might recall when Kathleen was d director of the Chicago office some years ago. One of Kathleen's first tasks was to oversee the first audit of every diocese, archdiocese, and eparchy, as Eastern Rite dioceses are called, for the purpose of evaluating structures and procedures at the local level for the protection of children and youth. She was assisted in that process by William Gavin and Associates and 55 former FBI agents. They know how to ask the best questions and they know how to get the best answers. Yes, some of the, bis the bishops and diocesan officials were off put by this process. The results of the audit were released in January, you may recall. What did we discover? The vast majority of dioceses are taking the issue very seriously. They are working diligently to shore up the gaps in screening employees and schools at every level and institution from coast to coast. You must remember, as I learned, how very independent each diocese in America is. They are kingdoms unto themselves. Bishops are expected to keep their noses out of the business of other bishops. Their geography is sacrosanct. Even the Conference of Bishops can only make suggestions on how things should be at least up until Dallas. The issue of sexual abuse by members of the clergy has reset that clock. The charter enacted in Dallas is binding on every diocese. Bishops are not free to dissent from the policy, as one bishop discovered. Refusing to cooperate with the audit, he told us he would only do so if the Pope himself ordered him to. He did cooperate. Some of us heard rumors that communications from high places within the Vatican made it clear everyone was to cooperate. He cooperated with the audit. So I think we can conclude he got his call. He did not cooperate, however, with the John Jay study and threatened to pursue us. The precedent for the audit has been set. It is the first of many. We are serious, and dioceses across the country will come to see the effects of their efforts year to year. 
They have goals toward which they must work. I wanted to say this to you so you can understand the framework for what was released last Friday in Washington, the two reports. They are part of a process in understanding a serious issue. And as I see it, a part of a process for re-establishing a sense of trust and hope among Catholic people of the United States. Let me address those two reports now and examine their impact not only on the institutional character of the church, but even more importantly, their impact on the lives of ordinary Catholic people in the pews. One of the great dilemmas in addressing the horrific issue of clergy sexual abuse was that few relevant or even trustworthy facts were available to us or to anyone. There were no competent statistics. This was not information bishops shared with one another or with anyone else. So the National Review Board had no way of knowing what the bottom line was in numbers of accused clerics. We were talking about 10% of clergy, 50% of the clergy. Was it worse in larger dioceses? Were there places around the country in which higher instances of abuse occurred? We could answer none of these questions in the months subsequent to Dallas. We knew the first order of business would be a statistical analysis. There was important data to be gathered. Best of all, it was part of the mandate of the Conference of Bishops. Our board selected the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City to carry out such a study, the first of its kind. And I'll be honest and tell you that it was suggested to us that we should select a Catholic university to conduct this research. Of course, the board wouldn't even entertain such a notion. We knew from the outset that even the appearance of evidence tampering could not be allowed. We felt that at least with a secular institution, we had a fighting chance. That may have been our first real skirmish with the hierarchy. It helped us resolve any question of the board's independence and freedom to conduct our work with transparency and credibility. It was then we knew how important it was that we were lay people, working as lay people, without any constituency, and I believe that paid off Friday. Let me give you something that before last Friday, no one, no cardinal, no bishop, no board member, no state's attorney, judge, attorney, or victim could have told you before. And, is, and that is the honest, truthful, hard-nosed answers to questions of the hour. By now, you may be familiar with them. Out of 109, 694,000 priests in active ministry between 1950 and 2002, 4,392, or 4% of them, have been accused of engaging in the sexual abuse of a minor. 10,000 victims, 10,667 victims, report instances of abuse. 81% of the victims were male. 19% were female. During the time frame of the study, the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s were the highest presently reported decades of abuse. Of the numbers reported, 50.9% 50, 50 of victims were between the ages of 11 to 14 years of age. 27.3% were between the ages of 15 and 17. 16% were between the ages of 8 and 10 and 6% between the ages of six and younger. 572 million was expended by the church in settlements to victims. And of course, this figure came about before the Boston settlement and many other settlements and contested matters that are still pending. What can I say? Of course, this is gruesome and grotesque terrible acts of personal violence to the most vulnerable of our, in our midst. But at least now, at this moment in our history, we can speak about this great assault with more accuracy and specificity. We know what we are confronting. 4% is a, an appalling number, but it's not 20%. We could never move forward without knowing the real picture. We could also not move forward without knowing how this unspeakable crisis came about. 
And this moves me to the findings contained in our board's report. Our board spent hundreds and hundreds of hours interviewing a wide section of individu individuals. More than 75 cardinals, archbishops, bishops, chancery office personnel, educators, victims, perpetrators, writers, writers journalists, civil authorities, and experts in the field were interviewed over the course of our work. Bob Bennett, Bill Burley, and I made two trips to Rome in the new year where we had some dramatic conversations with the most senior, high-ranking curial cardinals. What was so interesting was their sincere interest in meeting with us. Meetings with curial cardinals are not readily scheduled. One bishop asked me the other day, how did I get to them? And I said, I went to Google, got their fax numbers, and faxed them letters. <laughs> Of course, 2,000 years of a process was just down the drain there. Uh, and that is the truth. And they faxed me back. We were overwhelmed at their interest in candor. After 20 months of investigation, what have we discovered? First, we learned that the nature of this crisis is twofold. Both the sexual abuse of minors by members of the clergy and the failure of many church leaders who did not adequately respond in appropriate ways to the abuse contributed to the cause of the crisis. We also learned that dioceses and religious orders did a relatively poor job in screening candidates for priesthood, and seminaries did not form candidates for priesthood adequately. We believe that these facts, together with the environment created in these church institutions are significant contributing factors in why so many priests were allowed to abuse minors. Another discovery was that neither the presence of homosexually oriented priests nor the discipline of celibacy caused the crisis, though perhaps they may have contributed and had been contributing factors. These issues must be studied further as directed by the Charter. We will be drafting a request for a proposal, an RFP, in the next few weeks for an epidemiological study. And perhaps the saddest discovery answers our question of why so many church leaders failed to respond to the seriousness of the problem over a long period of time. What was it? Fear of scandal? Threat of litigation? Failure to understand the extent of harm suffered by the victims, with an asterisk. Reliance on treatment programs for abusers and putting the priest's interests above, vi above victims and the failure of the utilization of canon law to remove priests from ministry. Once again, the failure of leadership expanded both the continued instances of abuse by many priests and the victimization of the abused. These individuals have a lot to answer for. In light of what we learned, the board made six recommendations that we believe can help to prevent such abuse from happening in the future. The church must ensure better screening, formation, and oversight among those preparing for the priesthood. The church must become more sensitive to those making the allegations of abuse. The welfare of victims must be a priority. The church cannot be paralyzed by the fear of litigation. They must act decisively, giving priests due process and victims protection. There must be a wider accountability of bishops and church leaders. Bishops must be challenging to other bishops to be responsive in preventing abuse. Local diocesan councils should be revitalized and even developing some type of new accredited visitation of each diocese. Consultative boards of the laity should be considered. The role of the laity should be expanded, playing an active role, working with the hierarchy to bring about open governance of the church. Interaction with civil authorities must be improved. All allegations must be reported to the proper civil authorities. Further study and analysis of what we have discovered must come about. The bishops must move ahead with a comprehensive scientific study 
relating to the instances of sexual abuse in the larger society. This is only a start. These are observations that are patently clear in light of what has transpired for the past half century in the church in the United States. I know this is a lot of information to process. We and many others will be lurk working long time for information in the future. But it is possible to draw some conclusion even at this moment. With the data collected, we recognize that this is not an issue confined to the Catholic Church. It is part of our culture. As my friend Scott Turow wrote me, those who think these issues have Roman Catholic borders are going to be sadly surprised in the coming days. As both a lawyer and a writer of fiction, I think Scott offers all of us some important perspective. This work is a beginning. We believe the issue of sexual abuse of minors is so significant an issue that other institutions should be encouraged to self-examine their own organizations so that a fuller societal picture of this horrifying issue can be drawn. For Catholics, this is not simply a failure on part of some priests, but rather an issue that points to the failure more significantly on part of the bishops and church leaders who did not act appropriately. Bishops have acknowledged their mistakes. A very prominent one, Bernard Cardinal Law of Boston, with intense pressure from the laity, resigned over his failures. Around the country, bishops are enga engaging victims with more support and sensitivity. Bishops are taking practical steps <coughs> to ensure abuse does not continue. So it is possible to say that minors are safer today than they were before. And finally, we can conclude that trust has been deeply eroded within the Catholic community. And that trust can only be restored through a painful healing process that we believe has begun with the, with the willingness of the bishops to ask the laity to commission the publication of these reports and their willingness to take steps necessary to change attitudes and policies ingrained in the institutional character of the Catholic Church. Most of all, the Catholic Church is first and foremost a community of faith. We know that the healing process can only truly begin through our commitment to renewed vigilance, prayer, and a commitment to meaningful reform. I truly hope that this is the process to which Catholics in the pews will hold the leaderships in the Roman Catholic Church too. What our board has been able to accomplish is just the beginning, although it is not bad for just 20 months. I will take time for, it will take time for the dust to settle. And I don't mean the dust that is stirred by the people who write headlines and buy ink in bulk in 55 gallon drums. I mean the dust that comes from wisdom and perspective and the advantage of seeing things in the long run. The accomplishments of the National Review Board might appear to be right out of the Da Vinci Code, but in point of fact, it is really more about a story of faith and hope, the essential virtues of survival for everyday people. We are a people who believe in the ongoing mystery of grace, that is, the life of God at work in human living. In spite of the long litany of horror that has befallen the Catholic Church, we believe that grace will transform the terror of the present, not by magic, but by our willingness to engage the truth. For ultimately, what the church has been engaged in these past 20 months since Dallas is in the embrace of the truth, the often frightening reality of what humans are capable of creating for themselves. The work of embracing the truth is also affirming, enriching, and life-giving. I hope that despite the shame, shock, anger, and pain, you will judge us by what we do and say. Only this can free all of us from being prisoners of the past, its paralysis and its failure. We can change things once we are willing to know them, heartache and all. Thank you very much for your willingness to listen to this difficult subject. Thank you for being so attentive. And most of all, thank you for the privilege of sharing this with you this afternoon. 
And Jay says I have to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Jay has told me that if you have a question, please go to the microphone, state your name, and uh, whether I have an answer is another thing, but you can ask a question. Let's see. Good afternoon. Uh, Dennis Quinn, Justice, and great uh, talk, and really uh, enjoyed it. What can we do to keep the abusers and the sickos off the streets so the kids are protected? What can we do? Well, first of all, each diocese um, does have um, the names of those who have been accused. And I think it's important um, for, for us to uh, know who they are. And I think that the only way you can do that is to keep vigilant in each diocese, hold the um, diocese accountable, not only for um, who they are, but making sure that the environment now is in is safe environment is safe for children in each diocese and as lay people we should all be working to make sure that our each church has undergone that process lay council have you done background checks um, for uh, every employee or even every volunteer so it's up to the people in the pews now to make sure that everyone um, is accountable in the diocese we must work together this is um, not just you have to do everything, but we all have to work together. And, and there are good lay people out there that can help um, dioceses in this process. Yes, Father. Father John Hoy at Loyola yes. University. Yes. Thank you for your wisdom and for your uh, courage and for your, uh, your energy. My question has to do with guilt. And the question of guilt uh, connected to sexual abuse. It seems to me uh, that there was a lot of naivete on the part of the hierarchy that if a person was a, an abuser, that that was a moral issue rather than a pathological issue. I'm wondering to what, to, to what degree the analysis that's now being done, including your own, is, is taking into account the involuntary character of abuse. Involuntary because of the pathology of the abuser, and I don't know the degree of this, I just want to pose it as one of the, the complicating issues but also the involuntary issue connected to alcohol, the addiction of alcohol. Has that come into the examination of the report, and could you say something about, about that? Because it seems to me uh, one of the reasons why we're scandalized by the hierarchy is because they, they were taking this to be a moral issue, and, and I wonder to, to what extent it is. Um, our report does discuss um, those issues, Father Foley. Um, and in fact, uh, alcohol could be, substance could be a contributing factor, the environment um, could be a contributing factor. And this is why the larger epidemiological study needs to be uh, completed. And in terms of the hierarchy, in th their response to an accusation, did put the priests um, um, before the accused. And they did believe that it was um, a sinful act, but they never took into account, of all the cardinals and bishops that we interviewed, never one of them did they say it was criminal. Never once. It was sinful, but not criminal. And so that's another issue. But uh, it, that's why we need the future study. But yes, we took into account all those situations, Father. We need more studies. So if you can encourage um, the provincials uh, as well to um, go along with the future study, we would be very grateful. Oh, yes. Good afternoon and thank you. My name is Edna Salon Epstein. I wonder if you know and could comment on what the reaction of the Vatican is to some of this report. One hears in the newspapers that they think that, as usual, Americans have gone overboard 
and are reacting too stringently to this, or does that not come within your purview at all? Well, um, I did mention in my remarks that um, I visited the Vatican with two board members twice. The fact that they even recognized us as a lay board was significant, because I wrote to the papal nuncio twice and never he heard back from him, um, except through a phone call um, by Bishop Gregory, who said the nuncio had called him, which I had never told Bishop Gregory that I even wrote the nuncio, um, and uh, said that he could not meet with us because it was not in, within his jurisdiction. We were only a subcommittee of the bishop's conference. So that's when I started faxing the, um, the, uh, the cardinals in the curia. And the fact that they even met with us is significant. Um, we had very frank conversations about all the issues that were reported in the report. And the names of those people we did visit in Rome are listed in the back. So yes, they, they have um, listened to us, and um, hopefully um, the word will get back here to the bishops. Thank you. Hi, Justice Burke. My name is Janine Stevens. I had a couple of questions. My first question has to do with the accountability on behalf of the Archdiocese, particularly of Chicago, for orders that operate within the Archdiocese. And I'm thinking primarily about the Congregation of Christian Brothers that uh, runs the uh, Brother Rice High School and St. Lawrence High School. It's my understanding that the Archdiocese did not include the victims from St. Lawrence High School, of which I think there are three known and ten that have not reported. Um, included in what? In the Archdiocese did not include my my. Clients? My clients, two of them. There's a third one who... In what, though? In, in what? In, their, in, in, their in, the in this report. In their reporting to your board. Oh. Um, well, with regard to who um, the specific accusers are or who the victims are, we have no knowledge. The process for the John Jay study was done um, this way. The, um, the, the instrument John Jay sent out to every diocese. The, um, there were several parts to it, the cleric part, the victim part, and the diocese part. Each one of those portions of, the, of that study went back to an independent auditor in New York. And the, the, the independent auditor, Ernst Young, had encryptions um, uh, for the, the initials, the birth date, and the date of ordination for each cleric, and then also information with regard to some victims were also <coughs> encrypted. So that information was given new identification and then sent to John Jay. There is no knowledge of who was a victim or who was a perpetrator. Now, as I said before, with regard to the information you need to know has to come from the diocese. You could ask the diocese who they included because they have the information. Right, and that's and I'm saying the archdiocese is not including orders, and so well, if that number orders are included in this in this research. In fact, um, out of the all the orders in the United States who acted voluntarily, I might add, they they are not subject to the Charter of Child and Youth Protection, but came forward as an organization. The major superior of men have come forward, had did come forward, and said we want to participate. And 63 percent of those orders did come forward and um, and voluntarily submitted to the research, which represents 80 percent of the one-third of all priests in the orders, which are one-third of the, all the priests in the United States. So we have an overwhelming voluntary um, basis for orders participating. So that information came directly um, from the orders. Okay, and you're talking about the priests within the orders as opposed to brothers, is that correct? It, all clerics and deacons. Okay, thank you. Sure. Justice Burke, Helen Rainforth. It's Helen. Um, I would like to state that six and a half years ago, my family became involved in this horrific situation of the crisis. And in that six and a half years, we have been to Rome 12 times delivering oh. documentation and paperwork, of which Cardinal Ratzinger stated that Cardinal George would help us. When we reached Cardinal George, he, of course, said, go back to your right. own bishop. Our bishop at that time was Bishop John J. Myers, who is now Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey. Let me state two things. First of all, when they talk about credible victims or credible allegations, 
13 men in, in uh, Lincoln, Illinois, went forward with a case against one Monsignor. And in print and by the Diocese of Peoria, they were, quote, none of them credible. Now, that was, of course, as I just stated, six and a half years ago. However, after the charter, after the report, after all the work that your board has done, within the last four weeks, the Diocese of Peoria put out their report, and all of the figures were 100% misleading. Even their own diocesan attorney admitted that the figures were totally misleading. Four weeks ago, another victim, an adult male victim, came forward in Peoria, Illinois, and within 24 hours, his entire reputation was put on front page headlines that the bishop, I mean, he totally defamed this man's character. With that being said, do we have any governing body that right now we can turn to with what I just spoke to you about? Thank you. Well, hopefully um, your vigilance will not you know, go astray. Um, this is just the beginning. And the Office of Child and Youth Protection, Dr. Kathleen McChesney's office, needs to look into these issues. Um, if you feel, or if any victim feels they're not being um, uh, spoken to appropriately or treated inappropriately or ha something hasn't been followed through, you must call Kathleen's office. And this is the importance of the future work of the, of the, of the board and, and the bishops. We have to make them continue to do audits. Under the auditing process, which we hope will be an on-site au uh, audit again next year by these um, people or in addition to, um, is that we will flush out those kinds of you know, inaccuracies, discrepancies in the process. There have to be lay review boards who have credible people on the board. There have to be standardized um, rules and regulations by which they uh, uh, conduct themselves. So in the future, that um, you will not go on deaf ears. But thank you for all your you know, intuitiveness and, and veracity to keep forward, and please do so. Thank you for coming. Justice Burke, my name is John Ryan. <coughs> God bless you and thank you. My question has to do with uh, an item that I was heartened to see in your report on the causes that had to do with how the board sees its authority for what it is doing. And I'm referring to the little paragraph where you cite Article 9 of the Charter, where you say you derive your direct authority from the bishops. But I was heartened to see you go on and say it was really Canon 212.3, where the board seats itself as deriving its ultimate authority. Yes. I would like you to expand on that, and because some of us had some concerns about the future of the review board, mm -hmm. how the board came to include that, and what the thought process was, and what, if any, reaction you're getting from the bishops. Thank you. Well, the last first, because I usually can remember the last question first. <laughs> um, no reaction um, from the bishops. I've only had one of my colleagues on the board say that um, one of his former bishops called him and just didn't agree with one of the conclusions that we came with. Um, but outside of that, I've heard nothing from anyone. Um, with regard to our authority, you don't need canon law or a charter for authority. This church belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to the hierarchy or to priests particularly. It belongs to all of us together, collectively. So it's up to all of us. Not only that, but I think a lot of us have just sat back and have become passive Catholics. But for this crisis, would I, I'd still be a passive Catholic. In coming forward, I think this crisis has caused a turn in the Catholic Church where we now know that it, we, do, we can empower ourselves on other issues. And I think we should. And woe be it if we don't. Yes. Your, on, Your Honor, uh, my name is Graham Grady, and uh, first of all, I, I commend you for taking on this difficult task. I admire you so much for doing it. Uh, it is truly um, a, a measure of your service and love of people. Um, although my name is Grady, and although I grew up near the Dan Ryan Expressway, I am not a Southside Irishman. Oh, wow. My point, my point in particular is I'm not- Or a female, either. I, or no, a female. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're wet, you're wet. Okay. Um, uh, I have a comment and a question. Um, I'm not Roman Catholic. Um, 
you mentioned Catholic people and trust of Catholics in the church. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, it became apparent to me from a very early age that the Catholic Church was not only there to service the Catholic community, but to service all humanity. Um, in my neighborhood and beyond, I learned about homeless shelters, service for um, poor people, um, uh, food centers, soup kitchens, um, all kinds of different programs, uh, elderly programs, adoptions, etc., which serve Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, whomever. This is my question. What, what can non-Catholics do to help restore the faith, the much deserved faith, in the Catholic Church and help remind the public that the Catholic Church is a force for good and that the vast majority of clergy, and I also have to mention the nuns because the yes. nuns do so much throughout our community and even well beyond the walls of the Catholic Church. What can non-Catholics do to help remind people of the positive force that the Catholic serves in our society? Well, Graham, I think the, the best thing is to do what you're doing and serve people with, in cooperation and communion with, all denominations should be working together for the same goal, for the betterment of humanity. And it is true, and that's why I prefaced my statement today about the good priests. They're still out there. We need to work with them, we need to help them and boost them at this particular time. And I think from the ground level, the laity have to help restore the trust in the Catholic Church, not only from within ourselves, but from the greater world outside. And thank you very much for your thank comment. You. My name is Mike Radzalowski. I have a two-part question. It goes, and it probably goes, you mentioned the Da Vinci Code. One of them is, that, is there any consideration or any way of dealing with the fact that you're having like a male-dominated hierarchy viewing what's going on, and the other part of it is having priests with celibacy and the issues that sur surround celibacy, whether that's ever going to be revisited. And the second part of it is if you ever had anybody look at the statistics or try to determine, because it would seem from my experience that the abuse of women has, is, is seriously underreported in those statistics. Yeah. There are no national statistics, as I, as I said before, Michael. Um, this is why this is a first. Um, there are uh, issues with, uh, within the greater society that um, don't, sex abuse doesn't get reported. It's, it's a secret out there. And there are no general statistics. And with regard to celibacy, we do uh, you know, address that in our report, and it needs to be studied. We don't, you know, it's not a cause that we know of. It may be a contributing factor, but it doesn't necessarily mean a cause. So I think it needs to be studied further and it carefully, and it should be in dialogue with everyone on the issue. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Rick Springer. I'm a survivor and a member of Link Up. And first, I want to thank everyone here for your care and concern about this issue, for all of us. Uh, I have three questions. One uh, involves the gag order, uh, which the uh, Cardinal has recently said that if anybody wishes to apply to have it removed, uh, they can get it in writing. Um, and my, my argument with that is that uh, that puts the onus on the victim to apply for righting a wrong. And we feel that it should be the arch up to the archdiocese to notify each and every victim who has been under a gag order to be notified in writing that they are now released. I think that will uh, make it possible for other victims to come forward as well. Rick, that's a, that's a good idea. And um, I can't really comment on any specific case because I'm not aware of any, and that's not been our job. But I think that's a suggestion that you might want to pose to Kathleen. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that it could be addressed that, through that process. And thank uh, you very much. And I apologize for any of um, the suffering that you have done over the years. Rick has come to a number of meetings um, with our board and has offered a lot of uh, good information as um, another survivor that's in um, the uh, audience today, Bobby Sittering. And we appreciate that, Bobby, that all the things that you have done um, and helped us with uh, get through this process. Uh, two more things. Uh, one is that the, uh, I was recently uh, enacted a new law on the statute of limitations expanding it. And there has been, uh, there has been a couple of dioceses and the Christian brothers who are fighting this and trying to overturn it. And I can say that we're not very happy about that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is that the Diocese of Chicago has offered to put up a website where uh, people can punch in the name of a priest and get information on him, as opposed to, I believe, the Diocese of Los Angeles is posting the names of all the priests 
living in debt who were abusers and listing their uh, uh, their posts where they were assigned. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would be something also the Archdiocese of Chicago ch should do instead of what they're proposing to do now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, as I mentioned in my remarks, each yeah. diocese um, is directed by the bishop himself and they make decisions in their own local diocese for whatever reason. Thank so, you. Thank you, Rick. Justice Burke, Joel Cohen. Yes. I really just have a comment and um, I am uh, non-Catholic but I do strongly believe in the uh, Judeo-Christian ethic and I think that uh, your work is truly unparalleled and that you cannot be applauded enough for your wisdom and your patience, your courage and your strength and um, Thank you. you know I'm sure it's going to have a relevant impact, um, not just in the next 100 years, but probably the next 2,000 years. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay.